Okay, so here we are in Estremoz, and I'm looking for a view of access to this property today. And this is the castle here in Estremoz, which I find very picturesque. So, and it's spring, and we have um, all the, well, actually the grass has gotten a bit too high to see the poppies, but there are some poppies in here. And now what we're going to try to do is find a view of the castle uh, with these sort of spring fields in the foreground. So now the issue here is, you know, the, the crop right now, the, the field is about the same uh, amount as the hill. If we kind of lowered it, then we get the castle, uh, I would say, up too high. Also, we have the very strong line running through the middle of the canvas, which uh, kind of breaks the, the flow. The, the eye will kind of go across the field and then stop along those line of trees. There is a, a horse down there, um, which if it got closer, it could break the lines for us. But um, I don't want to rely on the horse. And so we're going to move further into the field and see if we can find a better view. Okay, so this is another view. Now, I've talked a bit before about how you don't really want to see a uh, building, for example, or any object where you don't want to compose it in a way where you have the same sort of amount of each uh, side. If, if you imagine a box, you don't want to see the same amount of, of uh, each side of the box. And that's a bit kind of the risk here seeing a lot of the right side of the of the castle and about the same percentage as the front. On the other hand, this spot has a lot going for it. For one thing, it's like one of the hottest days of the year and uh, there's shade. So uh, that's great. And then the composition, you know, we'll take out some of these thistles from the foreground but basically having a, um, you know, this sort of wall over here on the left um, kind of counterbalances the fact that the, the hillside is, has the weight to the right of it. So I think this uh, works a lot better as a composition. We don't really have any flowers that I was looking for in the foreground, but maybe we can do those from... Um, a later date in uh, back where we were before but uh, it's a really nice spot <coughs> great for my hay fever and um, you know things there are often other considerations to setting up and uh, finding a view in landscape painting one of them is uh, the heat today so uh, standing in the shade is going to be really nice uh, when I was just down in the Algarve I had a lot of problems with uh, vertigo so a lot of the views I wanted to paint I couldn't uh, stand as close to the cliffs as I would have liked because of my fear of heights I feel a very rational fear of heights but um so yeah it's often the case that you uh, your choice of uh, location for landscapes might not be entirely uh, based on the the best composition so I think this works quite well for us and it's a comfortable place for me to stand so we're gonna set up here okay so here we go um, I should warn you I'm standing under olive trees and I suffer terribly from allergies to olive trees so this might be uh, might be a lot of sneezing during this demo but uh, we're gonna try to capture this uh, view of the castle as I said uh, before with the setup, I really like the, um, the angle on the castle. I think it's, it's a particularly beautiful castle here in Estremoz because it's, uh, it's very sort of uh, delicate, almost sort of um, feminine, motherly, with these two arms uh, facing over the town it protects. And then on the other side, it's stone and quite austere and uh, not a lot of um, ornamentation or detail. and from the other side of the, the hill, you can barely see anything. You know, it's uh, protected and 
offensive and sort of threatening. Whereas here, it it looks down over uh, the town, and it's a it's just a subject that I've always found very beautiful. The reason we originally moved here is because uh, we were looking for a town in the area with uh, large windows for painting, and uh, Estremoz at one point was very wealthy and had uh, they have all these um, palaces with very large windows and. The whole town faces north, so more or less, and so uh, that's one nice thing about painting it as well is that uh, I tend to like the backlit views, and much of the year the sun sort of uh, goes up and uh, down behind the castle, so it's a, a very picturesque subject, and I've been looking for a while for a view where we see a bit of this uh, sort of austere um, threatening side on the right and then this the very beautiful uh, more delicate um, with these two towers on um, on the, the side that faces the town so that's it we'll jump in i'm going to start by uh, keying my sky and you know just above the horizon tends to go very um, uh, cerulean kind of a greener sky one thing that's quite interesting though in these uh, if you look at Soroya's paintings and in general uh, with these uh, very hot uh, some uh, these very warm uh, Iberian skies I would say uh, he often appears to put a touch of a, a kind of a strong red in his skies and I think it works really well to give this sense now it's still spring here it's not too hot but um, but if I look carefully I can see just a hint of this uh, red which often works very well with the um, uh, the cobalt which is sort of a neutral blue and uh, the white and then just a touch of the cad red uh, medium that said, uh, low on the horizon here, it does go very uh, uh, sort of green. And we've had, yesterday it rained and we had a lot of wind, so it's a very clean sky today. Uh, down on the horizon, it often gets kind of uh, muddy, but today it's a very uh, clean sky. So we'll stick with the cerulean. I mean, honestly, to my eye, you could almost just get away with that. You know, if I force myself to look for some of the reds, I might be able to see it. But now with sight size, I can make kind of an imaginary um, rectangle the same size. And then as long as my head's always in the same position, I can see uh, all the proportions exactly. So if the castle's this big in nature, it's going to be exactly that big. Now, a nice thing to do often is to sort of find a center line to decide what is going to be in the center. You know, if I was doing this as a sketch for a larger painting, I might have these kind of olive trees leading in. But as a finished small painting, I think, and I, again, I can, you know, move my head back and forth to decide on my composition. And I think in the middle, I'd like to try to have this uh, one of these towers. And so maybe just build the castle out around that. And sight sizing. Um, let's see, this is about the center. 
It's going to be about the castle. That's the tower behind it. And you can sort of mass in all the shadow area here. Now with that um, composition, we're gonna end up with another little section down here, which is very similar in size and shape to this, which might not be such a great idea. So what if we put the other tower in the middle Okay, so where was I? I was deciding what to do here. This is crazy, kind of reflected warmth onto this uh, the tower back there. And I think I'm going to stick with my original idea. I really, you know, if I look at, even though compositionally there's some issues, I find this uh, the most sort of inspiring uh, uh, composition. When I look at it, it has sort of a meaning to me. So we'll uh, see if that works uh, in the end. I think, you know, there are definitely times when you come out working and you'll find a perfect composition but I think there's also times when you uh, come out and you you know maybe take a risk set up something that uh, might uh, be a bit uh, unorthodox but if it speaks to you uh, I remember when I was teaching landscape painting in Florence I used to basically uh, have the students pick a view and show it to me and I was I found that I would shoot down a lot of views that didn't really work compositionally, but a few times I had students who, you know, insisted anyways, and so I would let them uh, continue, and I realized that sometimes they would pull off really interesting compositions because they had a, um, just a real strong uh, emotional attachment to the, the view they had found, and even though it might not have worked compositionally, and I explained to them why it didn't, but they would, uh, you know, just power through and produce some really nice work. So I, I sort of stopped. I try to uh, give people compositional advice, and I think obviously you don't want to beginner's luck where you're, you know, pulling off paintings. Uh, it's actually an interesting discussion in general, this idea of luck in art, because it definitely is something that. Uh, happens a lot um, when you're out painting you can just get lucky and especially beginning students um, you know I've had students get into galleries with a, a painting that was brilliant but it was sort of the only one that they had done at that level and then uh, they didn't really their careers didn't may not have panned out as well because they weren't able to uh, to reproduce that and so I think it's important to, uh, to get a proper training because you can't really count on the luck. Um, you know, it kind of, it comes and goes. And so you need to be able to paint well uh, without, um, when you're unlucky too. So, but, uh, but yeah, compositionally, I do think there's a, a valid uh, argument to be made that uh, if you really, really feel, have a strong feeling towards a composition, then you can uh, ignore compositional rules and, uh, and jump in and have fun. So here I'm kind of mixing this, uh, the white that's quite interesting here in Portugal, how many of these white buildings we have 
uh, against the sky. So I'm going to lighten it here against the, uh, the dark wall, and then we'll probably have to take it a touch darker as we get up to the... Uh, Through the sky. And advantage to painting stuff that you've, uh, you know, that you can see from your window and you uh, know what's going to happen is I know that this little white line here on the tower is going to kind of creep up, become more of a triangle. I think it'll be more interesting than this uh, long straight uh, vertical line that we have right now. So I might just put that in. This is sort of an unfortunate tangent we have going on here with the tower and the round tower here in the foreground and then the distant tower behind it. Um, we're going to break the rules. And what we can do is just step a bit aside to uh, find an, an angle where that, uh, where this maybe gets broken a touch. Uh, one thing you should always do too with uh, landscape painting is just kind of make sure that uh, nothing's going to change too dramatically. So that's one thing I forgot to mention, but I, uh, it's a nice thing about painting a north facing view is, or north ish, is it's basically going to stay the same all uh, afternoon. Um, one thing I had a question about recently on Patreon was this uh, idea of uh, brush handling. And it's something I can sort of uh, discuss a bit here. I mean, one thing that works really well when you're painting a backlit view is kind of to, to mass everything in. Now here, using a bristle, also I tend to want to hold the brush uh, further back on the handle. I often have a bad habit uh, because I was a bit self-taught at the beginning of holding my brushes uh, further up on the handle, whereas you want to stand back and, you know, use, you're supposed to use your shoulder much more than your elbow or your wrist. But as I said, I, uh, I started painting late and I actually used computers and airbrush uh, before I ever held a paintbrush, funnily enough, my generation. But, um, and growing up in Los Angeles. But, uh, yeah, you want to try to, now with these small paintings, I don't really see how you can paint with your shoulder, but um, you are supposed to hold the painting, the paintbrush back a bit farther so you can uh, stand back. But sight sizing like this, I'm going to get up and niggle. And then... Let's see, I find I, you know, kind of, I like these sort of parallel lines, strokes, um, and then, you know, massing in, it's a really nice 
effective way to, uh, especially with shadow areas, is if you mask the whole thing in with kind of a neutral gray or dark, and then you paint into that, it can be uh, really uh, effective. Um, especially if you use kind of these mediums like this, because then when you, uh, if you, you know, don't just use pure paint, but thin the, the paint and then paint into it, your, uh, the brushes, uh, the brush strokes are gonna fuse just ever so slightly which is gonna give you a really nice kind of, you know, in the shadow, you don't want too much detail. So uh, just this uh, fact of using medium, massing in, and then painting into that kind of soup, uh, is gonna give you very nice uh, soft edges. Now, I personally never really tried to develop a style in my brushwork I had uh, gallerists from important galleries tell me that I needed uh, to get into their gallery I needed to uh, develop a more individual style but for me my own philosophy about painting was much more this sort of reverence of the natural world and not trying to impose a style on my on my art but sort of you know I had this kind of a mystical approach at the beginning where I was trying to be uh, one with the, this visual world and let the visual world sort of paint itself through me. Um, a lot of it based on these sort of Renaissance uh, Neoplatonic treaties and that I was reading a lot at the time. And I think that's one that's interesting because I had that idea sort of before I even uh, discovered uh, Charles Sessa Studios and the sight size technique. But then sight size really uh, worked uh, for that technique of just sort of relaxing and letting, uh, you know, stand in a certain spot, you see a certain way, and then you uh, capture it without trying to be gimmicky or use um, any styles or... Uh, but I think at the same time you naturally everyone's going to kind of develop a little a style on their own and i think it's happened somewhat with my painting but um but as i said it was not my goal uh starting out um so yeah i don't know if the backlit painting is the best for uh, showing off brushwork because, like I say, I tend to do this sort of soup and kind of paint into it. But I think as we get further down in the foreground, we can, uh, you know, I think too, a lot of times, you know, I try to, to make a brush. I don't try to make it, but, it, you know, if I want to have like a heavy... Uh, impasto, you know, I'll try to make it a bit more uh, visually interesting and, uh, you know, I tend to use the sables for these, certainly for these small areas. The, um, I think as well, I would say that one thing that I do is um, I'll often sort of try to make a brush stroke look interesting by, um, you know, using the, the colors next to it. So I'm not actually uh, trying to hit a brush stroke, a clever brush stroke right off the bat but I'll use the colors next to it to kind of carve it and may even make it look like a brush stroke that uh, has an interesting shape, but without actually trying to get it with one, uh, you know, uh, with one clever uh, brush stroke. 
These sables are great too for doing these kind of razor sharp. When I was talking about uh, compression of values, I was talking about how there's a school which uh, kind of exaggerates the compression of value a bit um, and it looks really good. Another thing, maybe not the same school, but uh, other painters I've seen will often um, exaggerate the edges. So you'll have a, uh, these fantastically sharp edges and then really, really soft. And it's something you see in 19th century paintings too. And it, it looks really clever. Uh, just really interesting, visually interesting to see where if you take a, an e you know, a kind of, let's see, we have a bit of a, you know, a bit of a cast shadow behind this tree. And if we make it really, really, really soft, the the difference between uh, the uh, the light and the shade. And then when we go in with our um, our trees, let's see, I'll spot this one first. It's not the one I'm talking about. So, I mean, this may not be the best place to do it because trees should be kind of soft. But if you had like this really, really soft edge there, you know, in this uh, kind of very faint uh, cast shadow. And by soft, I mean like, you know, it takes an inch or a few centimeters to kind of blur the edge out. And then elsewhere, let's say just really close to it, you can have kind of a razor sharp uh, edges really show off. That sort of uh, demonstration of brush control, now I'm not going to leave that because I find that too sharp, but that sort of demonstration of brush control where you play with really sharp, sharp edges next to really, really soft edges, or at least in the same area. It, it looks, it's very effective. Or, um, there's a beautiful uh, Signorini painting. It's in the Palazzo Pitti, you know, just a little view of nothing. And he has a, I think it's an agave or something. I'm trying to find it. It's just got these razor sharp uh, edges in uh, the drawings of the plants. And then these beautiful transitions, which are really, really soft. And uh, so that sort of variety of edge, uh, I think, can make for really interesting visual um, effect. Now let's see, my drawing is way off so I'm gonna just stop talking for a second and try to get that back. And the same thing, like on this kind of roof, we can have a razor sharp edge against the sky. And again, I'm using a brush that's uh, perhaps too big and it's full of uh, medium, but it's very easy to get a, a very strong, sharp edge by then just cutting in and I want this edge to be kind of soft 
under the roof line, but I want the, the line above to be quite sharp. So again, painting into it with this kind of soupy medium. It's going to give us a nice soft edge on one side and a sharp edge on the other. Okay, so one thing that's I was saying before, we'll try to keep all of these sort of very soft. And these kind of razor sharp. Like so. And again, I want to try to keep these edges kind of soft. Here, I'm going to go in with the bristles because I have to cover a lot of uh, area. And like I said about soft edges, like here, for example, oops, 
you know, the transition in the shadow can be really, really soft from the sort of blue up to the warmer. And then by putting brush strokes over, you know, I've got a bit of variety where here the, the edge is softer, the gradation is softer, and there it's a touch sharper. But painting into the medium, again, allows you to keep these edges quite soft the whole time. And I'm still undecided about whether or not I want to put some red into the sky. I kind of like this very clean um, blue that we have today. So with these little windows, what I like doing is kind of painting the lighter frame first. And then after the frame is done, then I'll go in and
put the darker area of the window. Is it slightly too dark? Every time the wind picks up my allergies, so. start up. With these backlit greens, you know, they're, they're all going to be very, very similar in hue and value. There are some subtle differences. Um, another thing I would like to mention about these, this idea of uh, brush handling is I rarely get like a clever brush stroke on the first go. So, um, and a lot of very good painters I know who, uh, who you would look at their work and think it's, you know, very clever. 
brushwork, they tend to do the same. They will uh, scrape down and start again over and over and over until they get their clever brushwork. It's not a, um, you know, it's not that easy to just, uh, again, you are kind of relying on luck a bit to get uh, these, some of these very clever brush strokes. Too cool. Too light. This is one of those cases where I was trying to be clever, it didn't really work out, so now I'll uh, cut it in. And just like we did with the castle, I just realized if I uh, Sight-sizing and checking. I need to cut this up a touch. Where are these spiders coming from?
And then down here we have the buildings, and so we will mass in our sort of shadow color again and then paint into it. This sort of blue-gray that is so typical here in Portugal with the white buildings and the bright blue sky. I'm going to try to get this very strong contrast between this, the, the greens and this tree here and then the, the slightly lighter, duller and bluer uh, greens behind it. There's this wonderful Levitan where that's basically the whole painting is just a very subtle difference between uh, two lines of greens. Um, and showing the atmosphere between them. One thing that I find very helpful too in uh, is to uh, make sure your brush is dry with a bit of soap in them and you get the very fine points find it very uh, helpful when drawing um So uh, those are the wrong colors and kind of in the wrong place, but it's an example of a nice little accident, so we'll leave it. As these trees come forward, they're going to get a bit more orange. And a bit higher chroma, so 
Get out the CAD yellow medium. And then as I go further back into the middle ground, I'll switch to the cad yellow light as it's slightly cooler. These are also different species of trees, so they're also uh, kind of a cooler green here. And now these wonderfully bright roofs. And again, I'll do my best to get some clever brushwork, but then I'll cut it in a bit. Putting in all the the roofs right next to the light, and then what I'll do is I'll run a little thinnest line I can next to them, a grayish line. And then I'll cut it in again with the, the building color. And it's, you know, it's precisely these kind of dark areas that are gonna really give the sense of um, the lighter areas next to them.
You paint into that with some areas lighter and some darker. There's some sort of darker uh, greens, but will also give a sense of that kind of warmth and by painting in a touch of the, the red. And again, it'll make it much more interesting as soon as we put in the windows. My proportions off a touch. It's difficult for me to concentrate on uh, talking and the things I need to say, and also uh, nail my drawing. I think there are other artists who are very good at this, but.
bit of polish here. Some of these shapes up above. It's nicer the way this kind of drops and then comes up. Keep the edges soft because it's uh, bushes, and then we can take it even darker to do some of the sky holes. But uh, stepping back, it doesn't really work. These are a bit repetitive and perhaps a bit too large. So we'll cut them in a bit. As the sun moves around, we're starting to get more light on this side of the castle. I actually want it all in shade, but uh, some of these little accents are nice. Speed up a bit because cows. I knew they were bringing cows in, I didn't realize they're already here. If they don't have the little ones, they're usually not aggressive, but what happens is they are very curious. And in my experience, it's happened a few times that if you're painting in a field of cows, they will come over around you and then just start pushing the um, easel. These are the little black uh, lines that they have on the buildings here because the, the queen Santa Isabella, who lived in the castle when she died, they, uh, for their mourning, they put, uh, instead of the blue or the yellow stripes, they put black ones.
Okay, so we're now in a calcium. Uh, be moving away again. As I say, it's kind of annoying painting in a field with cloud, clouds, the with cows, because they will uh, just kind of creep up slowly and then surround you, and then they start kind of nudging the easel with their noses. Usually they're just curious, um, unless they have the young ones, in which case they can be aggressive and knock on wood, I haven't been charged by a cow, but cameras are running, so you might catch the first time, yeah. Nice rich uh, dark greens in here, and we can try to soften. Some of these transitions have some sharp edges and some soft edges. I'm sort of going back and forth with the painting over areas and then I come back with the object in front and paint back over that. Very nice cool green over here. Not too dark. I 
And I'm sort of keying this a bit low because I don't want it to, to jump out too much, but maybe we can take it a little bit brighter. Over here is kind of a jumble, so I'm just kind of massing in with a, a general warm dark gray, and then I'll go back in afterwards and pick out some little accents. Very dark trees here. I used to get teas that I paint like an inkjet printer, sort of. A lot of it comes from, uh, you know, keying the sky first. Basically, after that, you just start working down, and and then I'm constantly keying off of the sky, so. And just like I masked in the shadow areas up there, I'll just kind of mash in a general kind of grass uh, color here. And then I'll uh, kind of go through and pick it out, pick out the accents and uh, so. Might be better off just a touch higher. We can kind of use the bristle brush to uh, make some of the sense of the grass. Too many parallel lines, so we'll kind of pick some areas off. And I'm going to try to make kind of a larger area here, and then slightly smaller back here, just to give a sense of the plane. And it's kind of a small. Sort of this 
a bit lighter area to kind of pull it forward, but now I've maybe lost a bit too much of my... Uh, We can put in some of these darker accents and then really soften them. And let's put in some of these little lines. Out. Kind of getting as close as I can to some of these sizes and the positions, but it's really not uh, that accurate. So I'm going to go back afterwards and uh, Gonna pick some of these areas up, push them back a touch, and we can bring in some more reds back here. It's kind of nice. And then as the sun goes back behind there, this, um, you see more and more of this kind of uh, red in the sky. So like this is just ultramarine, uh, sorry, uh, cobalt, which is a much redder blue than the cerulean. And then next to the cerulean, it kind of reads as being a touch redder, so. And I think that's about it. What I would like to do now is just kind of add a few accents. Uh, and again, having the, you know, the brush with the soap in it gives you just this very, very sharp edge. And so I would pick out some of these and, you know, the paint may be at a, a little bit time to settle, settle and dry. So it's uh, easier to cover. And I don't think it really does that this time of year, but I kind of like that. Um, little sliver. And sharpen it. And I think there actually was just a touch here too. And we can sort of 
find some little white accents too in the town just to uh, and maybe sharpen some of these edges. And one last thing is, unfortunately, they've removed a lot of these chimneys. At least I can't believe these. But uh, chimneys are great. Anytime you have a chimney, you always want to put them in to sort of break some of these horizontals, maybe even a little bit of a cast shadow. Okay, so I think that's about it. It's about lunchtime for me. Actually, one last little thing I forgot is have another nice little vertical down here, this tree area here, and then that nice little. And actually, there's some really nice darks down in there too. Where they came out. Okay, so I think that's it. Uh, hope you enjoyed the video. I realize it's a bit all over the place, but um, really just edges and general kind of process for uh, plein air landscaping. So thanks for watching.